okie dokie, I will, uh, I won't get too hung up if the, um, if the IT goes down. Um, I've, I've got a few slides, um, so, which I will, will share now. Can, can you see anywhere my screen? We've also been joined by Rory uh, McInerney Brash, who's, who's, on, who's online as well. So welcome, Rory. Um, so yeah, the, the session aim is, is quite open-ended really. Um, I saw the, the fantastic agenda for the week and because I know John from working on infrastructure systems together, um, where well, I'm really interested in the resilience and the, the net zero aspects and the other societal benefits infrastructure can enable if we characterize it in the right way, if we make decisions in different ways. Um, I contacted John and said, what would cyberneticists or cybernetics practitioners do in the, in the case of, of net zero strategy? Um, so the, the aim is to kind of catalyze some open-ended discussion amongst amongst the, the five of us, six of us, six of us, um, around the potential role of cybernetics principles and cyberneticians, um, if, if cyberneticians is the right word, can play in supporting or enabling or catalyzing progress towards net zero targets, um, and more broadly in response to the climate emergency. So I'll, I'll give a bit of context, but I won't aim to shape the discussion too much. And I'll propose some discussion questions that we can discuss. Um, and because the idea is open-ended, I don't want to constrain the discussion. I want to catalyze it. So if the questions I've suggested don't are preventing us from really exploring the topic in the way you, you guys would like, then then we will we will deviate from those. Um, I personally, I want to download as much as possible from your brain at the moment because I know there's a knowledge and understanding and just ever thinking about a differential between yourself and myself. I don't know how far people in the rest of the room are like that, but I mean, if you start off by being fairly centralised and autocratic, then you get the nerve, we can sort of move towards anarchy, but you know, that's, uh, <laughs> let, 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 let's have something that we can respond to if we think possible. Okay, that 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 make that makes sense. Um, so, the the questions I was thinking we would ask, and then and then I'll give the the context and the the the, the background of of the the knowledge and, and my think some of my thinking. Um, is that if cyberneticians ruled the world, what would climate emergency strategy look like? My my assumption here is it would look different to how it how it currently looks. Um, I'm very critical of the Glasgow Climate Pact that came out of COP26. I, I think it's, when, I, when I'm being at my most critical, I think it's scientifically, ecologically, systemically, and even economically illiterate. A remarkable achievement to get 186 countries to sign something, but not enough given what we know and where we need to get to. Um, so yeah, the first question would, would be that. And then similar would be, oh, if you were making recommendations for climate emergency policies, what would they be? And what fundamental knowledge, cybernetics principles, cybernetics ideas is, is missing from the discourse around the, the climate emergency? Um, so, as promised, here's, here's the context. Um, so the climate emergency, and I, I, I've used to group the need to prevent global warming, i.e. to achieve global net zero, um, and to enhance the resilience of the systems that enable our economies, societies, lifestyles, to the impacts of global warming of 1.5. So from the IPCC work, we know that global warming of 1.5 degrees is pretty much inevitable. Um, and that this will have disruptive impacts across the globe on the systems that underpin our societies and then on our societies and our economies themselves. Um, if we don't achieve net zero, 1.5 degrees 
could be up to four degrees. Um, and, and that change won't be linear in terms of the impact, it'll probably be quite pronounced. So we need to look at both simultaneously, synergistically, and, and, and find ways of responding them together. And to do so is a, a global necessity. Um, and the consequences, the opportunity cost of, of not doing so, um, I, I think is often underestimated when looking at the, the benefits of, of acting should be measured against a, a counterfactual of what actually happens if we don't do anything. Um, and all too often, certainly, I feel in the field of infrastructure, that's, that's not the case. Um, I'd love to be wrong, so if, if, if I am wrong, please, please tell me. Um, so why have I got emergency in this odd, odd way? I'm trying to link emergent properties um, with the, the word um, emergency. They share a common root. Um, and for me, greenhouse gases, and indeed all polluting emissions, whether they be greenhouse gases or, or air pollution, water pollution, sewage, waste, these are all emergent properties from the, the systems that, that enable our, our lifestyles and, and power our economies. And they, they've, so they, they emerge as, and they're secondary to the primary goals of the, of the system and that we've tolerated them historically as externalities. They've been low priority, they've been seen as low value, low consequence. Um, and that's an erroneous assumption. But we've been holding on to that for so long that it's deeply ingrained in the very structure of all the systems that enable our, our societies, our economies, um, and our systems have evolved in this context. And I think that's quite important because the way we're trying to address it is incremental, but it's, it's, it's a deep systemic problem. Um, which can also be referred to as a wicked problem. So I, I don't know whether that's terminology that's used in, in, in cybernetic discussions, or whether there's a, a more cybernetically centered way of describing a problem with, with has no one common cause, no magic bullet solution, will need a portfolio of actions, um, will need engagement from across all levels of society. Um, We'll need to look at not just technical fixes, but government fixes. We'll need to look at mindsets that inform how we set the rules of the system and the objectives of the system. Um, and, and we'll need to be integrated into all decision-making processes. To my mind, we can't have policy for the economy and then policy for sustainability. We need policy for a sustainable economy. Um, and, and forgive me if that's state, stating the obvious or, or if that seems a, an obscure distinction, um, but net zero, resilience, um, sustainability, these are all qualities that need to be attached to, to the outcomes we want to enable um, rather than things in, the, in their own right. All policy should contribute to them rather than some policy dedicated to them and other policy inadvertently undermining or undervaluing or eroding um, them is, is, is my perspective. Um, and they're, they're deeply interdependent, as mentioned in the first slide. So if we don't get to net zero, we will need to be resilient to the impacts of four degrees of global warming. Um, if we do get to net zero, we'll only need to be, we hope, resilient to the impacts of one and a half. So they have to be seen as addressed at the same time. Um, they have to be addressed synergistically. I think systemic transformation is, is needed for both. So it's, it's an opportunity to, to do the systemic transformation needed for one, to do it, to do it for both and align those. Um, and stressing the word global as well, the, the UK net zero target is, is precisely that, it's a UK target. Um, getting our economy to net zero is, is good leadership nominally, I think, but if the emissions, as is the case, I believe, associated with products consumed in the UK but produced outside of the UK, 
if the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that consumption aren't included in the UK's net zero target, then unilateral, yeah, unilateral targets such as ours just create incentives to outsource pollution to other, other countries, which doesn't help the global necessity. And I would say undermines the strength of our own economy um, and therefore our ability to actually be, be resilient to the impacts of, of global warming. So it's, it's, it's got to be global. We, so we either need all countries to have net zero targets so that the emissions associated with UK consumption are accounted for somewhere and a part of the, the broader global net zero ambition. Or we need to make sure that the UK in its attempt to be a thought leader and, and, and a leader in action um, actually specifies that its target includes the emissions from things consumed in the UK. Um, and it's, it's net zero, again, forgive me if it's taking the obvious, but the, the, the net concept implies that some will have to go beyond zero, others won't be able to make it to zero, but if we break the systems such as infrastructure down into component parts and try to go all zero um, rather than strategically targeting parts of the system where we can, can act, looking for the leverage points as Donella Meadows would, would say, then I think we're going to encounter disproportionately high marginal costs as we get closer and closer um, to, towards zero. So there'll be diminishing returns. Um, and then I ran out of colours to highlight things with, so I've gone text, but societal resilience, why it's, it's so I'm interested in infrastructure, but the benefit of resilient infrastructure relates to the benefits of infrastructure itself. So infrastructure enables societally beneficial outcomes by producing a predictable, reliable flow of certain products that then act as inputs into other societal and economic processes. Um, so the resilience of infrastructure is a buffer for society against the impacts of global warming. Um, so it's the resilience of particular key systems we need to look at, but in the context of um, enhancing the resilience of society as a whole to, to the impacts of global warming. Um, and I think, I think I mentioned why it should be simultaneous and synergistic and why, why it's a global necessity for, for global action. So that was as much context as I, as I wanted to, to give. I, I can give more if you would like, um, but if you're happy to do so, um, we can start open-ended discussions, um, either looking at, by looking at the questions I suggest or by discussing any thoughts that what I've just said has prompted amongst those present. Um, so I think I mentioned the questions, but just to recap, they're, they're here. Um, so at this point, I will stop, stop talking um, and ask whether you have any immediate questions or thoughts or whether you would like to spend some time looking at, at these questions. Um, so. What do you think, David? What do you think, everybody? Can I, can I ask one question? This is Megan, just a, maybe a clarification question on your, if you don't mind going back to the last slide. Yeah, hold on. There we go. Yeah, so I just wanted to better understand, um, I might have misinterpreted, but when you have your, your point one and two, preventing global warming and enhancing a societal resilience. And I think I understood that you were saying they're both independent, they're going to affect each other. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I 100% understood your point about um, on that, only because I can understand why the resilience or how resilient is sufficient is obviously going to depend on how successful you got in the first one. So it's it, it's dependent, but how does the amount of societal resilience 
to then go back and affect the first one. Does that, did, does that make sense? I guess I'm, I'm seeing why number two follows number one, but I'm not seeing why the second one is then actually uh, affecting the first. So if, if maybe I'll state it a second way. If I got my societal resilience to the point that I actually could cope with a four degree change, but actually I was also successful at preventing global warming that it actually only got to the 1.5, is that, is that what you were trying to drive at? I just wanted to clarify what your thinking was because I'm not sure I that was obvious to me. Do you mind still just expanding oh. on what you was on that? Yeah, I, I think I think I understand what you're saying, and it's 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 a really important challenge around the directionality of. So I've been saying they're interdependent. You're saying well, there's obviously a direction between one to the other, but why does enhancing societal resilience benefit efforts to get to global net zero? Um, and I, I think there are a, a few points that I, I definitely didn't make explicit. So I think if we know that we're resilient to, to, to likely to be resilient to four degrees, it gives us more time to reach net zero um, targets. So that so that that would be that would be one. But um, Uh, several, several, several others, but my mind, my mind has just let me down a moment. I, I wasn't sure if I was missing a fundamental point. That's why I just wanted to ask if I, if I was missing something. No, you're, you're, you're raising a fundamental point. Uh, I, um, I, I think I could maybe suggest, I mean, one thing that occurs to me as you're describing that was that if I increase my resilience, my belief that it matters that I need to prevent further global warming might actually lower or my drive to do so. I mean, you made the point it might take me longer, but actually you might stop putting effort into to it if you think, well, actually we're resilient and it will be okay, even if that's just your perception. I yeah. don't know what you meant, so thanks. That's... Yeah, so I, I, I think I'm, I, perhaps I've been using the, this, this argument previously to to make a case for we still need to think about resilience even if we're aspiring to net zero because 1.5 degrees is, is kind of locked in. Um, Keith, Keith Clark who was I think he was a consultant at Arup, um, he's, he's said previously that to mitigate, no to adapt without mitigating is, is, is amoral. Um, so very much the if we put all of our eggs in the resilience basket um, then we're, we're abandoning um, a lot of the global population who don't have the resources to, to increase their resi resilience to it. Um, but if we don't, then we're assuming action on a global scale to get to, get to net zero. So I, I think there's a lot in the dynamic between the two, but no, that the challenge you've raised about explicitly demonstrating that more societal resilience Will help with net zero um, is one I need. I need to focus on. I, I think. Um, so no I, think, um, I, I do hope, by the way, that um, Rory and Mick Ashbury feel free to unmute themselves and throw things in. There's, we're just seven of us here. It shouldn't need aggressive facilitation um, from myself. I mean, one thing we've noticed in the past is if you don't know the solution starts several things going and yeah there, there is potential uh, conflict there but if you can't you know work it out numerically or whatever uh, I mean that's evolution isn't it I mean there's a lot more to say there yeah um yeah so 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 Mick and Rory feel free to unmute or to, or to switch your your um cameras on um if if, if if you want um i did have a point actually um which is that um it sort of furthers maria's point but from a different perspective that um there may be initiatives that take away from working towards net zero but improve societal resilience because one of the things that i've 
been looking at uh, recently is economic development for one of my modules at university. Yeah. And one of the problems that you have is a lot of ways that a lot of the most effective ways and the most common ways for economies to develop is essentially to develop from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. It's very difficult to start poor people living in huts made out of mud that only have a bicycle as their single asset um, on renewable energy and expect them to economically develop. The, a lot of the trend is to get to the point where you are rich enough to use renewable energies. So I think to further Maria's point, there's it's trying to find the things that aren't going to cause a mutually exclusive relationship between societal resilience and moving towards net zero. Hope that made sense. Yeah, no, that that makes a great deal of sense. It sounds a bit as though you're, you're buying into the, the theory of Vickers Nets curve that as we grow, we'll get we'll get to a, a point beyond which we can afford to deal with the, the impacts of our our growth. Um, and I'm I'm not sure I I agree because well certainly in the developed context, if we're not at that point already, does that point really really exist? We we've had a lot of more or less prosperity and we're still facing down this problem and we're not we're not acting fast enough so the, the idea that you can get wealthy and then deal with the problems you've created by getting wealthy um seems optimistic to me and i'm not sure whether because because development needs the infrastructure in place but to be rich enough to have a, a centralized power grid um, it's, a, it's a big investment to have that that reliable power grid, whereas there, there are examples of um, kind of big infrastructure investments that have been sidestepped in a developing context. And I, I would say not the power grid, but the mobile telecommunications and mobile banking across parts of the developing world um, have have. have taken place in the absence of the established landline network that we have in, in many other de developed countries. So there are opportunities to sidestep in, in, in the, the, the development. So it doesn't, I wouldn't say it necessarily has to follow that we need a fossil fuel based power system. And then we start to think about decarbonizing. Right. Decarbonizing it. Um, but that's, that's an opinion that I can't substantiate um, so it might be one that others others want to, to chip in on. Are you saying here, if you can't solve a problem, you share the problem, you get up and hope that from somewhere among the, the variety of places where it gets shared, varieties of solution uh, come up. And obviously that can be dangerous, but it's probably less dangerous than trying to hope for one novel procurer uh, to... Uh, figure it out for all of us. Yes, that. Sorry, I, I, I didn't, I didn't. So, I'm saying is part of the solution is to teach the problem more effectively. And I feel also we have a, a number of dilemmas here. One is in looking for large scale generalized um, solutions, uh, or is it a lot of nitty gritty fixes here and there, you know, learn how to develop more uh, rural food under high heat conditions, uh, how acceptable, uh, well, a wider thing would be the sort of population sort of level issue is, I mean, lots of, some people are saying that's really not relevant, we're going to stabilise and go down eventually, but, you know, given a third of wild animals have, uh, yeah, sorry, two thirds of wild animals, the population has gone down in my lifetime while we've crippled our population. If I was a whale or an intelligent non-human, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be so um, relaxed about just letting a human population do whatever it's doing and try to fix everything else, which when I taught uh, some of these issues to kids like gifted and talented 
they generally were looking for scientific technical uh, fixes all of, of the time and I've become a little bit more possible hopeful about the possibility of avoiding mass starvation recently but so uh, it's an extremely complicated problem and I ask myself how far it is a set of nitty gritty things that you've got to address and have competent uh, people addressing on people even though it's a worldwide problem figuring out uh, situations in their own place as well so local as well uh, as global and the issue of getting collective global agreement i was amazed when biden actually started talking about globally uh increasing tax levels reducing of, i thought that was virtually impossible clearly it's not but uh, it's 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 not easy i i, I it would be interesting to hear your preferred fixes solutions uh or whatever i have an idea if I'm allowed to chime in, if any, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I remembered I've, I've done a, a little bit of research on wicked problems and looking back at my notes on it is that one of the 10 features of wicked problems is that every wicked problem can be deemed a symptom of another wicked problem. Um, so, um, so wicked problems are usually caused by higher level problems as these problems have multiple symptoms, which is what make, which is one of the reasons that they end up as wicked. Um, so if we are wanting to solve this as a wicked problem, then we need to find the highest level um, of problem of which we can solve so that then we get, for lack of a better word, a trickle down effect, because there may be, it's, it's finding the root cause because there are lots of, um, so for example, is net zero or, or is carbon emissions the problem or is the problem that we've got a fossil fuel based energy infrastructure for example um i mean you're more well versed on the the uh the climate and the energy uh, infrastructure than i will be but i'm just trying to apply what what i know about wicked problems to this so it's finding a higher the highest level of which we can solve this problem so that we can do the most good because there's no point um solving it for one african in a mud hut if we can solve it for the entire country or the entire rural region of people living in mud huts for example absolutely rory what would you uh throw out as possible top level um problems here um it's a difficult question it's a difficult question um i think that infrastructure definitely is an issue um and the problem is is that a lot of the a lot of the low cost um development tools that either individuals or countries or communities have access to are older technologies because the newer technologies are the electric cars but the older technology, so, so one example was, is uh, motorcycles. Motorcycles are very helpful for rural African communities because it allows them to travel to the urbanized, um, the urbanized cities or the ur more urbanized towns so that they can sell their crop. But the problem is, is that motorcycles are running on fossil fuels and the only ones that these African communities can afford are extremely low cost um, are the extremely low cost fossil fuel motorcycles, and that's a problem. So it comes back to to a podcast I listened to actually about cancer research, and one thing that I got from that is that there's two kinds of problem. There's a creativity problem, and then there's an engineering problem. The creativity problem is actually coming up with technologies. It's coming up with a new drug for cancer. It's coming up with a new renewable energy technology or new uh, electric battery for cars, it's more efficient. The second problem, engineering problem, is actually making it more efficient, making it more cost effective to produce, lowering the amount of resources you need to produce it. So at a higher level, you could say energy infrastructure, for an, for an example, we've got wind turbines, we've got solar power, but are they as 
cost effective to produce? So are they cheap to produce? And are they efficient in producing energy as they could be? Those are two engineering issues because we've made the technology. It's about making it cheap enough for it to be used by these economies in the lower level of development. Because if you have the choice between producing a few more tons of carbon or feeding your family for an extra week, that's what these economies and communities are going to do. I hope that makes sense. That was a bit of a long one for me. Just a quick response and, and not really, it's not a challenge, it's more just reflecting back. What I find confusing in that statement, Lori, is uh, or the description from my worldview as an engineer, I find it confusing that you would say the creative side is the coming up with the technology. Because to me, I would identify that as engineering, and that engineering would be the cost and efficiency. So just to reflect back, I find that a very confusing description. Do you mean confusing you disagree? Yes. Or at least, in, yes. But I, I, what, what it does remind me of, about, though, is, and I, I think it brings up a good point, um, to, to give an example, I recently installed solar power at my home. Um, but if I didn't change my behavior about when and how I consume power within my home, I would be not getting the same benefit out of it, just the fact that I have solar panels. So for example, if I didn't have the awareness, if I wasn't monitoring and getting the feedback about how much power we were actually pulling from the grid and when during the day, and then thinking about that and how I might change my personal behavior. So if I don't wash my dishes overnight and I wait and walk and start the cycle at 10 a.m., that simple change means I am pulling energy, I'm using energy that's produced by the solar panels rather than from the grid. And so what I just want to throw out there is having the technology, so having the solar panels installed on its own doesn't allow me to capture the benefit, I also have to change my behavior. And what enables me to change my behavior in part is that feedback. And I think, Tom, when you were sort of just asking the question of what can cybernetics and other, um, other related methodologies or disciplines, whatever the appropriate word there is, um, is in part being able to help understand the what what is necessary to think through it's not there's a combination of things so for example the, the behavioral element how it's not just the technology how you'll get that gain and you made the point about the other second thing that i think it would help with communicating and thinking about is your comment that you can't just think about the target for the uk and we could describe that in other you know that's the same the concept of self suboptimizing at too lower level. So you have to think about your your goal if you care about an emergent property. You can't affect that by only trying to sub optimize the UK. You also have to think about if your decision is actually just pushing the problem somewhere else, you will not get the benefit that you're seeking. And that can be communicated or explored with some of these techniques. I think one of the challenges is that you it also sort of fall into the trap of are you are you um, trying to paint the picture fast forwarding what the consequences what will happen are you being extremist because you also commented it's nonlinear. I think the challenge there is it's going to increase in a nonlinear way, which for a lot of folks that are not numerate, that's a hard thing to, to wrap your head around because it's not intuitively making sense. Let me pause there because I said a lot. I think you wanted to comment or yeah, I, I want to go back. To, I want to go back to the higher order um, uh, point that Roy was making. So I think that there's some the surmise in that, and I'll, I'll just and I'll reference that to Solar Energy. So I'm a trustee of the Solar Energy Charity in Kenya and um, it's off grid right so we don't uh, they don't measure the petrochemicals that are currently used to light their homes you know they want two dollars a day but they pay 50 cents a day for petrochemicals to light their homes 
and the mobile phone example earlier on is they now need more energy because yeah. they've got mobile phones and that's also uh, coming from high carbon fuel. Um, you can buy a solar lamp uh, from um, one of the Chinese Amazon equivalents and have it shipped to Kenya uh, for about five dollars. Uh, so that, and that would dramatically change the life of someone who lives in that that village, but they don't know it exists, and it's in nobody's political or economic interest in that part of the world to make to make a difference. So the the point I'm making here is about the higher order problem and what prevents uh, us changing poverty in uh, parts of the world that are actually high, making a higher impact on this carbon neutral and developed world is because we need to, when, going back to what Tom was saying right at the beginning is we need to, the companies that are um, market capitalized in, in, in London and Singapore and Hong Kong to take global accountability for, for the impact that, that they're having from making profit uh, in other parts of the world. On the one hand, are, are there, so you're saying we need to spread information more effectively so that people can pick up on the things well, that they like, or uh, Google needs to market more effectively to oh, Africa. And it's coupled though, right? So yeah. ironically, if you, if you said that's your stated problem, that gets back to Tom's point though about if you're going to develop policies without recognizing the coupling, you could say, well, then I could I could address the poverty and the lifestyle and the quality of living. But that actually might make Tom's challenge of climate change worse. So I'll give one right? more example so to you tell count how many point. years and then you're gonna have a 40 year increase. Another, I've got another one, I've got another one up my sleeve. Okay. okay. So uh, Sri Lanka right now is having an economic emergency and food crisis, um, which is, um, if I could summarize, and maybe someone knows more about it than me, but if my, just reading the newspaper in, in this country on the Sunday Times, it's, it was explained to me as lots of uh, investment in infrastructure and developing um, the, the country, and to a point where the country felt wealthy enough to make some climate change decisions around um, pesticides, uh, what was it, what's the technical term? Um, synthetic, the, reducing the use of synthetic pesticides, with the impact of which uh, should have been great uh, for the climate and, and the environment and everything, but actually has caused a food shortage uh, and further poverty in that country. So I'm just saying that there is a, somebody's trying to do the right thing and buy into the mm. these global uh, goals, but it's had an impact on the higher order uh, problem. Well, I think that's it. And that, that's a, a very innate part of trying to, um, trying to impart change for emergent properties because if you have complexity in the coupling you often don't recognize the what's really going to happen until, until after you've made the change so whether you can predict the effects is often really challenging so i think one one challenge here is if if there's a misperception about how easy it is to, to come up with the solutions and to predict whether they're going to be good ideas, there's always a hindsight bias there of, oh, well, you're, someone should have to know better. Hang on, but what you're doing when you have your uh, solar panels on your house and your meter is you're thinking about why you need energy. You're, and you're saying, I can wash my dishes uh, tomorrow or whatever at micro level. If, if people sort of think about why they need energy at a global level, um, then you probably start to be able to think about some of the preventative 
Um, so you say we teach people um, a kind of philosophy of abstinence or something like that. I mean, I'm certainly quite, very happy for that to be done for everybody else. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I mean, we just talked about the, the Telco and, and we said it was somewhat wrong. I mean, sorry, Rory. Um, I think that I wanted to come on to the point that because I, I literally just remembered this might be a completely stupid point, but I thought I'd just throw it out there and see if anybody gets anything from it. Um, there's the supermarkets, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, Morrison's are very, very similar on price. There are slight differences between the two, but they're very similar. Um, why don't people switch to go to Tesco's to save 59 pence? It's because there's not a gap. There's not a large enough gap to justify the ambiguous cost of changing and cost of switching. So an idea is that the reason that people aren't switching to, to solar and these renewable energies is they might be cheaper, but there's this ambiguous switching cost that people aren't necessarily, that they can't necessarily pinpoint exactly how much it's going to cost to switch from what's working now to something that does work and may be cheaper, but we don't know how much it's gonna cost to switch, a switch, especially when it's an infrastructure problem. So there might be a, a more of a way for innovation to go to make things so cost reductive that people that are in charge of what energy is my factory running on can say, well, the gap is so large that any ambiguity in switching cost doesn't matter because the gain that we're going to get overrides that. Um, I don't know whether that has any relevance, or whether that's of any usefulness, but I thought I'd just shove it out there. Surely that's very relevant. And I think the infrastructure element should be in tandem with consumer choices and, and um, decision-making because there is this ambiguity around why you would switch. And so my area of work is going to change. So I think the focus alongside that any kind of engineering or changes needs to be behavior change experience. That it's really important mm -hmm. to that in order to make that society resilient, you have to focus on the two and the communication. Mm -hmm. And that's where cybernetics comes in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Around yeah. that information and that communication. But, so, is, but can I throw out a, a little bit of a, I don't know, is it a spanner really? But Another way to look at it, if you say, is it desirable? So, so to take that point, if you make the switching cost really low, because right now, as an individual home homeowner, to invest in solar panels, you need a reason. It's not an issue that I can't know what the cost of that is. It's in part is that it's an upfront investment that you may or may not be able to afford to do it, even if you knew what the switching cost was. Right? There's a there's a a delta there, but let's say you take that away and you say, okay, we're just going to make the solar panels free. Would that be the right thing? On an individual level, you could say, okay, everyone's going to make their own personal choice. But if I back up a second and take look at a bigger picture, would it be good, would that be desirable in the overall picture if everyone in Britain had solar panels on their house? No. So you have to look at the, and also, What's the consequence of all the battery production and everything else going in it? You only have a, yeah, and what's the cost of having, where would that be produced? Would that be in China? And what's then the bigger life, you know, you have to look at the whole end-to-end, -end, the whole life cycle and the broader, how much, it's not in, we don't have infinite amount of resources to produce some of the things that we're saying would help. So if we make the decision at an individual level, we will probably not, I don't guarantee, not solve the broader problem because we are self-optimizing. Like, yes, I'm lowering my personal energy bill. So there's the personal self selfishness to do so. That might not get us to net zero, not even close. It actually might make the problem worse as a, as a whole. Yeah. yeah, that's why it's important to, to solve it at the highest level. This is um, because you could as you said, to put the entire UK on renewable energy, but if all of that renewable energy is produced under fossil fuels in China, that then has to travel on a fossil fuel using ship 
to the UK, you're then throwing, you're, you're throwing, you're, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face, as, as I hate to use cliches, I do apologise. Um, so it's finding that highest level, at the highest level of which we can solve the problem. And is that a case of, um, is that a case of making manufacturing companies or not manufacturing companies, manufacturing countries like China, putting them on renewable energy? Is that going to be the, the highest order problem? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm going to say what you've opened up for as Rory in terms of, terms of getting people to, it is an issue of market design and Alvin Roth, uh, Nobel Memorial Prize winner in about 2012, a member of the American Cybernetics Society, um, I think points us this way because what you were raising was the fact that we've got a near oligopoly in food service supplies at the moment and to some extent as you address them or try to make the work market work more sharply, uh, you may get a, a satisfactory result for a while. And then I suspect, but I haven't thought this through, maybe you can help me here, the market will tend to restabilize. So is, is the answer manufacturing a form of money uh, for all comers to decide whether they spend it uh, on uh, solar panels um, or something else? Uh, there, there, there are so many, there's an infinite number of ways that you can design a market. Perfect markets, as you know, we learn, are very unstable, uh, but there, there are ways in which markets need to be modified and policed as well. And one tries, you know, the positive motivation uh, as, as much as possible on a positive note. On the other hand, fear does get people to uh, respond yeah, I mean, I wear with the Biofuelwatch um, org org organization. There's, there, there is also the issue of uh, getting rich by peddling solutions, which are not the best solution, arguably. And the sort of information that gets out, which allows more solutions from sort of lower base players to be uh, entertained, is something I haven't really got to grips with. Yeah, sorry. Need an information scientist or something. Sorry. I, I I've been been really in, enjoying ev everything I've been hearing, all all the points raised, um, and just just coming back on a few of them. Um, so in normal accident theory, dealing with what he defines as high risk systems, those that are tightly coupled and highly interdependent complexly interactive and, and tightly coupled. Pe Perot warns about the dangers of seeking technical fixes um, because it just encourages us to, to do more, do it, do it faster. We, we, we fixed it. So rather than that solving the problem, it just allows us to um, exaggerate or exacerbate the underlying causes of the problem that we fixed once. Um, so we keep keep going with 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 the uh, we're not addressing the root cause by applying a technical fix. Um, I think in the case of the climate emergency, there is, is no technical fix. Um, and this, this highest level thing that, that, that Rory's been mentioning, I think that fits very much with Donella Meadows and her thinking on leverage points. Um, so thinking in systems is something I'm a, a big fan of. And I don't know whether you others are familiar it's kind of the most powerful points to interact, inter, intervene in a system to achieve systemic transformation. Um, and right at the top is very idealistically transcend, transcend paradigms to so change the kind of narrative that from, from which all else flows. Um, and the, the net zero for me is shifting or should be seen as shifting the narrative around the acceptability of greenhouse gases and if we if we see it like like that and get governments to commit get organizations to commit 
and they do it for their all of their emissions associated with their value chains and their life cycles. Um, so I'd mention greenhouse gas protocol categories scope one, scope two, and scope three, um, which which then would would give individuals, companies, nations, cities responsibility for all the greenhouse gas emissions emerging from their activities and motivates then collaborative action to try and identify those leverage points those high level places where we can intervene in the system for the, the greatest shared benefit and we can perhaps share the costs of intervening in, in the system. Um, and another thing I, I would mention is we have a, a certainly in mature economies like the, the UK, the States, across Europe, we have mature infrastructure systems, much of which has long since been paid for. So the, 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 the sunk costs are low, so the marginal cost of the, un, the next unit of energy coming from that system is, is, is quite low. So if you're then trying to get renewables to compete on a cost, marginal cost per unit of energy basis, um, with a system that's already built and established and is, is is long long running, then you will face these capital cost hurdles that I think it was um, probably Megan that, that that mentioned of of how we can justify making an investment or taking an action that costs more in the short term but saves carbon in the long term, possibly even costs more greenhouse gases in the short term but saves over the life cycle. How do we really Pull in, pull in those things. And James's point around looking more broadly at the, the solution space as well, we're very, certainly in infrastructure, the, the UK has a process to assess what infrastructure we're going to need over the next 10 to 30 years. And it's very much, where's the population growing? Where are assets reaching the end of their life cycle? Turn the handle, therefore we need more of incumbent solution A or B. Or see, and perhaps we'll have a bit of an iterative evolution of that solution rather than what are the outcomes that we want to enable in 2050 or over the next 10 to 30, by the end of the next 30 years to, to stick with their time period and working back to what infrastructure we need um, to do that. And so therefore what changes we need to, to be driving. So looking at, at, at need that way and not framing need in terms of the characteristics of the incumbent solution or a particular technology or a particular sector that delivers the need, I think is probably important as well if we are to, to broaden a solution space. Um, so that, yeah, that's just a, a few thoughts. And David, just on, on market design, I, I've come to the opinion that I'm not sure because <laughs> yeah. if you change the design of something but the assumption that um greenhouse gases are acceptable is so deeply ingrained in how that the path dependence of the market and how it's evolved um then i, I don't know whether you can redesign at the market level or whether there's a more fundamental level we need we need to drill into um such as, so it's the val if how we va how we value the cost of polluting. So, do we need a, a carbon price, um, or do we need legislation that penalises emissions? Um, and if it's a carbon price, how can we make it something more fundamental than a, than a tax? How, how do we make it? Um, how how do we make it more more systemic and, and kind of and stick with it for the long term? Because it will cause, and I don't want to cause short term pain, but we're avoid we're avoiding long term pain by causing short term pain, which is kind of the point that. Nicholas Stern was making in the Stern report, I think, invest 1% of GDP now to avoid costs of this in the future. And rather than that being the underlying message, we bickered about the discount rate. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of 
barriers in 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 there um but we need to yeah change the value of or change the cost associated with polluting um but how we do that i don't know hey it's rory next isn't okay. it okay yeah go on rory um i wanted to throw the internet of things in there um because i did remember when i was researching about that that um a case study on barcelona uh, and this is going to come into a radical idea of how to how to change the world so do bear with me um but barcelona by making itself into a smart city um it uses the internet of things to identify car parking spaces it allows it allowed it to increase its car park revenue 50 million dollars annually by using the iot in street lights they saved 37 million dollars annually and they used smart gardens in their various national um, in their various parks and they saved 58 million dollars annually by making the current system more efficient and giving energy savings and cost savings that can then be channeled into government subsidies and government programs to research renewable energy to change the system to something different rather than making the current system of fossil fuels uh, more efficient. By innovating in the renewable energy sphere, you can then bring the cost down so that we then have a more cost effective system to switch to than our current fossil fuel system, which as Tom mentioned is, is the, the, marginal per, the marginal cost for fossil fuel is extremely low because of how long we've had this infrastructure in place. And by then bringing the cost of these um, renewable energy systems down, you can then start to inject them into developing economies because the cost is going to be the main thing for those economies. Because we already have the, um, the ability to produce renewable energy and have renewable energy infrastructure. It's about bringing that cost down so that it makes it advantageous for developing economies. So to sum up, make the current system more efficient, take those savings, put them into renewable energy so that you can then create a re renewable energy infrastructure. Does that make sense? Then, uh, could that just potentially, to so just playing that forward if I may, if you had uh, more renewable energies in areas that don't now, could that potentially actually drive up usage in areas that then actually create some higher demand for products, which then consumes more. Okay. You get where I'm going? Like, yeah, 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 there's an yeah. unintended consequence yeah. that you might actually just be- The cheaper we make it, the more we use. That, that's, that's why I mentioned that the it that's would be with the government. So rather than private industry using, because McKinsey have found that one of the, uh, the key areas of um, Internet of Things value um, in the future is going to be operations optimization. However, if we're looking at a basic economic view of government and a basic economic view of firms, firms are profit maximizers. So we can't necessarily guarantee without the right pressures, but that's a different conversation or a different topic for this conversation, that okay, our business is more efficient because we're using the internet of things, we're saving all this money, let's use it to make more profit rather than actually making our, uh, our firm more, work our firm towards net zero. But if the government is doing it, and the government is a, is a key spender in the economy and has massive infrastructure and is one of the largest firms as such in the economy, by offering those, that government that energy savings and then saying, right, any energy savings that we get from this will then be put into bettering society. I think that's potentially a greater likelihood of happening because it's the government and the government is designed to, to better society rather than to benefit itself in the way that the firm does. So that's why I was principally mentioning the public sector rather than the private sector with use of Internet of Things for energy efficiency. Yeah. Um, to, to, to me, there's a plethora of solutions which look like no-brainers. And it's interesting that Barcelona came up with this. I am somewhat aware that the sort of attempts to delegate, if that's the right word, uh, authority lower down in 
parts of Spain, if Barcelona still thinks it's part of um, Spain, have become more developed, like citizens' audit efforts and so on. And some of very thickening of democratic processes is arguably a part of the thing. I mean, if I'm satisfied with experts out there to sort out the sewage system for me, I'm very happy uh, to have an autocratic sewage system and I can sit and drink and talk with my friends. So, I mean, obviously part of it is getting people scared enough to take part um, in a democratic process. It's, and it's making that real enough for them to stay uh, in there, which um, puzzles me. But I think the implication of the wicked problems issue is that it is all fundamentally hearts and minds, but that doesn't mean the kind of novelty of PR simplistic programs that we've had so far. And there is this issue of just, uh, on the one hand, making more efficient and optimal our operations, our resource use. There's this phrase, satisficing uh, as well, isn't there, which has got a Wikipedia entry, uh, which I think is about accepting that some things won't go too well. So, you know, maybe a um, hundred million people will die or not be born. And um, how bad that is. I, I would like to touch on you know, what happens if we don't uh, do anything? Uh, you may know the uh, joke of a, a rare comet passes the Earth, and it says, yeah, uh, you're looking a bit flustered. Uh, what's the problem? Yeah, the uh, Earth says, uh, I'm afraid I've got an infestation of humans. And the uh, uh, comet says, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. Don't worry, it doesn't last long. From the point of view of other life forms on our planet, uh, maybe it's, it will be quite acceptable for just a few uh, human beings to get through the bottleneck to green pairs, as James Woodblock says, to the end of the century. That the way we're going, people are building their bunkers and setting up their 45 uh, villages in Canada. Whether we, whether part of the answer is to um, you know, get rid of those solutions so that they're forced to do something uh, more democratic, or maybe plastic pollution will just slow the birth rate uh, fast enough uh, for us to continue to to get the whole world below the replacement rate fast enough. I don't know. James, I think you, you James, do you have your hand up earlier? Well, then. Diverted a bit there with the uh, Sorry, so thinking about happens. your point. Um, yeah, I was going to. Uh, I was going back to uh, Rory's point, and um, we're like we're using more energy uh, than than ever. It's going back to that. It's like if you subsidise it, which is what we what we do. Um, then yes, we're becoming greener, but we're actually we still need the coal power stations um, up at Selby, which we convert to biomass large power stations. This yeah. word need is a weird it's the word. Need. It's the well, it like the in this country um, we subsidised uh, burning wood instead of coal because it's slightly less carbon. And <laughs> It's equivalent of taking a million cars off the road. Yeah. So that's a pretty big impact, but it's still not green. Um, yeah. uh, and it's it like America, America, where we get the wood from. Yeah, an American point. And, and, it, uh, and it's subsidised, so the taxpayer both pays rather than the energy consumer. Yeah. Um, so, um, what what has that really achieved? In, in, in this part of the world, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, there's things we're going to need nuclear or something else um, or gas. Yeah. So, um, to me, it's back to the kind of the the why we need energy. And well, I mean, the biggest growth is if we've been talking about smart cities. Mm. Well, all this data we're recording this meeting actually, so it's not, not a terabyte. Of, uh, mm. Sorry data, gigabytes, or data, um, data centers 
uh, in Ireland with only 30% of the country's consumption by 2030. Mm -hmm. um, so wouldn't we be better, better sort of on a global scale thinking about like when we design and make things that are consuming the energy? The yeah, answer is always yes, but yeah. it's whose interest is it, you know, to keep drugs going uh, is not impoverishing everybody at the moment. So the, the right level of challenge, coercion versus imaginative incentives versus hearts and minds versus teaching the whole of the world cybernetics so yeah. then their definitions faster or the kind of uh, Taliban structures which Omar was uh, talking about where there is more effective local information processing and addressing uh, problems which is great for our adapt adaptation but not necessarily for sustaining things. Yeah, I mean, it, going back to the African village, yeah. it's the same it's the same principle, is that it's not in the uh, tribal chiefs or the, the existing supplier of energy's interest to, to change, so they can do it. With seven of us, Rory, I will just chip in and see if you can get away with it rather than raise your hand to give you just a moment. Um, I wanted to, because something I got from what James just said is that, um, was we, we, we consume a huge amount of energy. So is it worth, instead of focusing on trying to make all of the vast amounts of energy that we use renewable, would it be more fruitful to focus on actually just using less energy? Because um, a, a, a similar problem was uh, a podcast I was listening to about sweatshops in uh, East Asia. And one of the problems they highlighted was that, um, yes, you can produce shoes ethically, but there's also the fact that people are wanting to have 10, 20 pairs of shoes. And that creates, that is a problem in, a, in and of itself is you're using such a huge amount of resources. So could we, if we sum it down to two problems, like fundamentally, either we need to use less energy or we need to, of the energy that we use, it needs to be renewable. So which one of those approaches is more fruitful? I, I can't see it myself as an either or. I think that's a really useful framing, but I, I think it's it's a, a, a both. We, we, we've got to reduce absolute energy demand um, and we've got to decarbonize as much of that energy production as, as possible. Um, but yeah, but both deserve deserve and focus. Which is easiest or cheapest? Well, easiest from what perspective? I mean, I think if you use some of the some of the systems techniques, this is what I think they should help to make it clear that the while it's tantalizing to think there's this simple solution of oh, we just have to change this one thing, it's that's not going to be effective. If you look at just the, the I think that's the challenge in the thinking is that we're thinking that there's just this simple solution. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just need people to do this and then we're fine. That's actually what I think cybernetics and, and some of the systems approaches should help to realize that actually you, you're, it's going to be a multiple prompt approach and you have to think about the trade-offs and you have to think about the unintended consequences that it's the, the dynamic in the system that as soon as you start to make a change, you then you don't want to get into a whack-a-mole situation. So if you don't start thinking about what will happen as a consequence of that, it's an overly simplified view of policy making. Mm -hmm. That's that I think is what these techniques have a potential to do is to break out of that thinking that it would just be a simple policy needed. Yeah. Great, great. Um, absolutely right. It is in uh, cool jet there is um, um, a CEO of uh, you see that sports behavior change. And uh, I think a multi-layered, mm -hmm. multi-pronged approach to a, a, a multi it's a wicked problem that is so layered that there is varied solutions. So I would also look at consumer choice. That's my area. And lessening that choice, like Rory said. So that's only one element of a big 
long chain of events that lead to actually the principal dependence of various peaks. So if you reduce one, it increases in another area. So we, yeah. I would be interested to hear from Tom about some of the ideas and solutions or concepts on a kind of high level as well as kind of an individual and because we're looking at individual individual changes, like we was talking about her change. I've checked, I've made lots of changes around solar panels, etc. But that's a long term kind of that that has an impact in terms of lithium, yeah. battery, you know, electric cars. It could go on forever. I just wondered because this is a big problem. Um, what what Tom, what's your what's your ideas? I'd like I'd like to hear some. It is a massive problem. It's lots of other issues. So, if I if I if I under understood the the question properly, um, I mean I I completely agree with everything you you've said, and it's those key messages of there is no magic bullet. Where we get to now. Oh, sorry, where we've got to now is a product of trade-offs, historical trajectories. It's not a system that's been designed for the purpose it fulfills. It's a system that's emerged and co-evolved with our, with our expectations. And so if we're trying to change that system, we have to be in-depth. We need really in-depth systemic understanding of how that system works and perhaps the why um, and the, the mismatch between that and now what we need to achieve in, in a net zero context um so I've, I've been arguing for it's, it's about a portfolio a diverse portfolio um a range of communities of interest stakeholders acting and by stakeholders i mean anybody who will be affected adversely or otherwise by climate change and who contributes directly or indirectly to climate change so all of us um it needs to be focused on supply chains but more broadly on kind of interdependent systems so not just the logical interdependencies of supply chains but the, the geographic interdependencies of co-location and the organizational independencies of asset ages and so, so many different things but it, need, it yeah it needs to be a port a portfolio of interactions but i, I think and I'm not sure we've done this more fundamentally. We need to integrate net zero as a quality that all of our, all of the outcomes we're trying to engage and create through policy and through all activities need to contribute to, to the, this, this broader goal. Because if they don't, then they undermine the ability to achieve whatever objective they're trying to achieve in the long term. Um, so I think I've gone from answering quite a contained question into being a bit vague. Um, I think the challenge though, that you raised there with the last point though, is whether, is it actually going to be possible to have a unified universal agreement that this is the most important thing from a policy perspective and therefore you might need trade-offs, which means other areas actually decline or get worse. But that's the right thing to do because it's going to help with this challenge. And I think what you're raising is if you don't do that, your sense is you feel like then there isn't a possibility of being successful in that zero. But that would that would fundamentally require everyone to agree this was the primary thing. And that might assert is probably not achievable well so, to a point and maybe uh, sorry I, I, I know we're always ahead of the stuff but it, but it's probably not achievable until and especially because it's a long the challenge there is it's a long-term relative it's not the near-term pain that people are feeling therefore the tendency to trade off something that actually is a short-term pain there might be something else that, from poverty or something else there's a whole host of things where someone may say well, I actually have an immediate issue I have to address. And that immediacy is always from the discounting factor. And as you said, that that is just by nature. Humans tend to, to address the immediate one versus the long-term 
That's that's a pretty challenging behavioral change to overcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Whether it's you know, and until you get to the point where the linear, it's you're not at the linear or the perception of the small incremental uh, pain point, and you get something like COVID where the the impact is so severe and so direct and immediate, it can't be it can't be pushed off, or at least the perception is it can't be pushed off. But the challenge is then, to your point of, well, will that become too late? But that might just be inherently the, the likelihood of how the dynamics play out. If that doesn't sound too pessimistic. <laughs> Rory. Um, broadly, I think we just actually need to do something um, because one of the things with wicked problems is that they are so complex and we can have these discussions and we can think about positives and negatives, but as long as we have these discussions from the perspective that if we make the wrong decision, the world is going to explode, then we, we create an environment of inactivity and not doing anything. And forgive me if my understanding of the cybernetics approach is primitive, I've only been in it about eight months, but if we see the climate and the economy and the systems that make the world function as black boxes, all we can really hope to do as mere mortals is tinker with them slightly and see what happens. I think that if we if we're constantly having discussions and constantly coming up with, oh, this might work because this, we're not going to be able to understand everything. So instead of, of course, it is important to have discussions. Absolutely. But there also needs to be a shift towards actually acting and doing stuff and not this idea that it's better to keep discussing and making sure that we do exactly the right thing. And then you just come towards perfectionism. And I think that you, you, don't, know, you don't know what's gonna happen until you actually try it. And I know that sounds extremely cliche, but we can't say for sure, we can't say for sure what's going to happen because we can't have a full understanding of the system that we're trying to regulate. The, the challenge is we're describing the two, the two ends of the spectrum though, right? Because action sounds really, doesn't that sound good? You're doing something that must be positive. Waiting is not a good thing. But, but acting without thinking through, your actions might be making things much worse. So the fact that you've acted is not necessarily that you're better off and you understand what I'm saying. There's a balance in between the two. There is. So maybe what we could do is instead of trying to solve it at the highest order is to not try and solve it at the highest order. Um, I know that goes against the idea of uh, wicked problems. Yeah, I would agree with you, Rory, because I think... Um, Which part? The, the first statement of doing it at the highest order or now saying that? I think we should do it at the lowest <laughs> because um, the highest order is not going to happen so quickly. So, um, but it might not be well, effective at a lower level. So that's right. Like, then you get back to your original. But kind of, reducing it, um, reducing your consumer choices, bringing that down, is it at a lower level? It, it doesn't necessarily have a massive impact. Whatever you can persuade what you people to do in terms of consumer choice. Tell me, is uh, further promoting women's education? a higher level solution because the more educated uh, women the smaller the family size. I mean, you, we've, we've got both arguments to reflect on and I'm very happy with um, both that and do something. If we do it anyway, it doesn't really matter <laughs> if we do something that doesn't work but might. Um, it's, not, it's, not that I'm against, it's not that I'm saying that um, it, it's my point that we, if we consider the climate and the economy as a system, a self, relatively self-regulating system, then we have to apply the black box principle to it, which is that we can't fully understand it. And if we can't fully understand it, then we can't know that what we're saying about what will and won't happen and whether we're going to make things worse, we can't say that that's going to happen with 100% truth. So it's, it's, about, it's about figuring out what level of truth of our disadvantages and advantages we're happy with to justify an action because we're never going to fully understand what's going to happen we have no idea what's going to happen because the system is a black box i think i think in reality though it, it, it's it's really easy it's a slippery slope that you can fall into um 
the, there, there's two fallacies. That's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to bring out is there's two extremes. There's the false sense that everything is going to be knowable and you can model it sufficiently that you can have the optimized solution. And I think that that's hopefully obvious to realize with something like this, that's not attainable. But I would argue it's equally false to think then therefore you can't make any sound decisions and there is no useful um, reason of thinking through. You should just act without trying to attempt. Like for example, you, you could say, well, let's just have everyone install solar panels with batteries in their home. Well, it doesn't take a really very complex, difficult calculation to say, do you know how much lithium is involved in that? If you just do the basic feasibility math. And I think we tend to cop out and not do any reasonable assessment with deciding the policy and the action because we're arguing it can't be perfect enough. The level of, there's always gonna be a level of uncertainty but that doesn't mean that you can't make some sensible, <laughs> sensible decisions. Yeah. That, that yeah. all is, it's, it's a balance, like neither extreme is right. There is that what's reasonable in the middle. Yeah, so you're not arguing uh, what Rory has said is unarguable, obviously. Um, you then it's a case of it's a case of finding out um, in that case, if it is a balance, it's finding the right level at which to enter addressing the problem. Because if you enter at the highest level, you're high risk, high reward. If you're, um, if you're whatever intervention you choose, uh, you go for it. There's a high chance that you're going to have lots of unintended consequences that you didn't foresee because it's very un uh, hard to understand the highest order level. Uh, but the lowest order level, you have the greatest, uh, um, you have the greatest understanding of it or possibility to understand it. But your intervention isn't going to have as much impact. So it's finding out which level you want to address the problem because getting, getting, for example, a plastic bag tax, lowest possible level versus let's redesign the energy infrastructure of an extremely mature, developed and complex economy. Those are two totally different levels. So which level do you want to attack the problem? Because then that's gonna show you where the balance is between action and discussion. It gets back to the portfolio approach, though. The idea that you're only entering at one level is, I think, too simplistic. Yeah, we well, always have to be a combination of levels. Not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. It's not only an either or for us as a normal futura. There are obviously loads of different agencies, collectivities, which will be addressing this. And although our president has appeared at the door, which is a certain kind of information, <laughs> Uh, signal. I really wanted uh, us to get on to Tom. I suspect you're uh, less peripheral to Extinction Rebellion, for example, which is a hearts and minds people movement than I am. I'm aware of some of the internal uh, problems that they have been having, and so on. So, I mean, if you're going to do a hearts and minds thing, as they are doing. Uh, what would your advice be to some of my mates who are sort of occupy diaspora sort of floating around that venue? And uh, <laughs> how long have we got, John? I don't see a great amount of uh, your overtime already. I know that. Okay. Uh, All right. 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 Sorry. Sorry. It's, it's 55 minutes till the next one starts. That's, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean every can walk out when that when they And I can, We'd be better to do a preemptive big thanks to uh, Tom. And I'll a lot of questions aren't questions, they're statements. But uh, I'm interested in your answer to what I said, Tom, is a very quick one. Yeah, so the Extinction Rebellion, I, I think, is, is, is fascinating. I think they, everybody says, oh, what you're doing, your protests, you're blocking infrastructure, you're bringing London to a halt, you're bringing transport links to a halt. Isn't that really inconvenient? Isn't that selfish? Well, that is the point. Transport systems come into a halt. Infrastructure systems grind into a halt, which is what the climate emergency is going to do, is inconvenient. It is selfish, allowing that to happen. So if you see how much inconvenience is caused to the users of infrastructure and all the societal structures that enable our lifestyles, just when a bridge is closed because somebody's glued their hands to it, or the centre of London is closed down 
because the taxi drivers are on, on strike. It, it is, it's inconvenient, but that is the point. It's giving us a snapshot into what the future looks like, will look like if we don't act. Um, but they, they don't seem to be capturing that as, as the messaging. Um, well, they do well because they've got Insulate UK, which can be the hard guys, and they can be the relatively soft guys. Guys, and um, again, when you want to break somebody down and persuade them, it helps to have uh, a variety of people and uh, all of them in different ways of uh, you know hard cop, soft cop uh, thing. But I, Tom, I thank you very, very much uh, for this and for you know <laughs> getting uh, forcing us to think, think and making me realise how inadequate uh, my thinking is. Is there any last word that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, it, it would be if you want to share anything this discussion has, has inspired, any thoughts on any of these three questions or any key points that you'd really like to, 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 to pull through from it, I, I will share my email address and I'd, I'd be interested to carry on elements of this discussion um, going, going onwards. And I just wonder whether we need yeah. uh, one, one, one final thought is around the concept of mission economy, which is Mariana Mazzucato, um, who's now at UCL, um, but, and the Council for Science and Technology independently called the Moonshots, but we need some structure that, that we need to launch the mission, we need to launch that moonshot. And we need to specify the destination we need to get to. And the destination we need to get to is a donut economy. So Kate Rayworth's concept of a donut economy, where the systems that enable it allow us to live above a certain level, you know, avoid food poverty, avoid water poverty, avoid energy poverty, but below a certain level, avoid causing the environmental degradation. So you know, my, my, my closing thought would be a moonshot mission to destination donut economy and we need systems that are aligned with that that principle um so yeah any papers and publications we'll source through john and i'll let you get dinner as lunch uh, possibly as well tom but thank you very very much indeed thank you everybody thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. really appreciate it